just preparing the stream. Just preparing the stream. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Rahul Rao. Uh, I work in the School of IR in the University of St. Andrews. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the erasure of Palestine in German-speaking worlds. Um, as we confront the daily grisly facts of genocide in Gaza, and as we try to raise our voices in horror, in outrage, protest, and solidarity with the people of Gaza, Every day also brings news of another event, another author, another artist who is cancelled on account of their solidarity with Palestine. And Germany has been a particularly vexed uh, locus place for these instances of cancellation and censorship. Uh, and the word censorship is advisable here because state power has also been brought to bear on the question of what can and cannot be said. Before we get on to that, I think it's fair to say that another world is being made in a variety of spaces, including in radical independent bookshops. So our first thanks today is to Lighthouse Bookshop, to Myri and everyone else who works so hard behind the scenes to keep the lights on. You have truly lived up to your name in being a beacon of solidarity and community and friendship in this awful time. Um, for those of you in the audience, if you have paid to attend this event, Please remember that the fee is redeemable against purchase of books by Palestinian authors. And we thought of Lighthouse for this event was that back in November last year, um, Hannah Dost, who works uh, at the University of Edinburgh, had organized a wonderful reading group around Adania Shibley's My Inner Detail as part of the Radical Book Fair, which Lighthouse organizes. Um, as many of you will know, organizers of the Frankfurt Book Fair canceled an awards ceremony for Shibli in October 2023 amid Israel's war in Gaza. In some ways, today's event might be thought of as a follow up to that reading group, uh, giving us a chance to explore and excavate some of the deep structures that shape what can and mostly cannot be said about and in relation to Palestine in Germany and the broader German speaking world. This event has really been the brainchild of Panis Musari Natanzi, who I will introduce very briefly and then hand over to. Uh, Panis is a political theorist and postdoctoral associate at Duke University. Uh, her work focuses on Afghanistan and its global political and artistic entanglements. Um, so Panis, over to you. Thank you so much, Rahul. Um... Salam and a warm welcome from me as well. And Rahul, I'm just uh, so deeply grateful for your time, for your support. It's uh, an honor working with you and learning for, from you for now uh, over 10 years. Uh, so thank you for all your work. Dear people, we are at a stage of this televised genocide in which Gazans are now being starved. Gazans are starving. There are no limits to the horrors that Gazans are enduring. Simultaneously, the Israeli genocide in Gaza is causing the death and injury and intensified incarceration of Pal Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. Next to the US and UK, German institutions, organizations, and the private sector are sponsoring this genocide. In order to maintain domination and the idea that the annihilation of Palestinians and Palestine is self-defense, Germany has mastered developing perverting logics. Since 1945, Germany has been at the forefront of distorting, disfiguring, and destructing the historical past of Palestine, the ethnic 
narratives of ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, the ongoing Nakba and the occupation and how this knowledge is curated and circulated for German law and politics. The German education system, the neoliberal university, newspaper offices and organizations are bastions of institutionalized erasure, policing and surveillance of Palestinians and politics for the liberation of Palestine. And I'm consciously not using the word peace here, but liberation. This erasure of Palestine in German speaking worlds did not begin on October 7th. The political and economic foundations were laid with the birth of the Bundesrepublik in 1945. So from Amman to Dresden and Berlin to Jenin, from Kabul, Washington and Vienna to Nablus, from Beirut, London and Zurich to Jabalia and Khan Yunus, from Tehran, Bern and Hamburg to Rafa, the places that we, the panelists, many of you and myself inhabit, in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, and in German speaking worlds that we embody and create compels us to seriously imagine the possibilities of language that refuses to normalize antisocial life and labor. In refusing psychopath politics that justify the structural confinement and destruction of racialized life, we manifest futures that do not cater to carceral capitalist states and systems, but everyone's liberation and we show that it is possible. So as we are grieving, let our love speak. It is our responsibility to be the manifestation of generative anger for Palestine and struggles connected all over the worlds in which we live and on our planet. Without further ado, allow me to introduce you to our wonderful panelists. So I like, I'm, cannot exaggerate how grateful I am for your time and for uh, your camaraderie and um, for being part of this uh, event. Dr. Anna Yunus finished her PhD in 2015-16 on race, colonialism and the figure of the Jew in a new Germany, in which she coined the term war on anti-Semitism amongst others. She is currently interested in researching what she called settler colon uh, coloniality and its transnationally operating technologies of power, as well as its psychic inversions of victimhood. She strongly opposes notions of German guilt and shame as explanations for today's politics. Her main theoretical pillars are psychoanalysis, settler colonialism and race critical theories, as well as researching transnationally and transhistorically. She curated Palestinian art, published journalistically, and has been involved in anti-racist and anti-colonial activism. Eunice's work can be found on academia.eu or else also on her website, anaistayunice.net. Dr. Sara El Bulbesi is a postdoc research associate at the Orient Institute, Beirut. She joined the OIB in 2019 after com completing her PhD at the Institute for Near and Middle East Studies at LMU Munich in Germany. Sara, uh, Sara's postdoc research at OIB revolves around the interrelations between systemic violence and family and intimate relations in post-war Lebanon. She is working with psychoanalytical methods in her uh, interlocation-based fieldwork. Before joining the OAB, she led the DAAD project Violence, Forced Migration and Exile, Trauma in the Arab World and in Germany, a higher education dialogue between several Palestinian and Lebanese universities, as well as with the LMU in Munich. Prior to that, she worked as a research associate at the Institute for Near and, uh, and Middle East Studies at LMU Munich. Her PhD thesis, Taboo, Trauma and Identity, Subject Constructions of Palestinians in Germany and Switzerland 19, six, from 1960 to 2015, was pub published in German in 2020 at a transcript publishing house. She is currently working on the publication of an English book based on her PhD thesis, and we cannot wait to read that. Hannah Al-Tahir is an interdisciplinary scholar, writer, and researcher trained in political science and international law. In her doctorate, Hannah researches gendered citizenship in Jordan, discussing the convergences and contradictions of claiming, resisting, and imagining belonging through the lens of anti-colonial theories. The objective of the research is a critical analysis of state power and the continuation of European imperialism. Hannah is interested in power state theory, magic, Marxism, and queer of color critique. She is a lecturer in political theory and gender studies. 
And course, courses that she teaches include um, witches, bitches, and other misfits, body politics and the states, and the state, decolonial feminism, exile and the city, Hannah Arendt and Edward Said between Jerusalem and New York, state and citizenship between national libera liberation and nationalist oppression. As a playwright, she elaborates on borders, racism, and imaginative possibilities. Hannah holds anti-colonial knowledge creation close to her heart. And last but not least, Imran Ferus. Imran is an Austro-Afghan journalist, author, and the founder of Drone Memorial, a virtual memorial for civilian drone strike victims. His work has appeared in Foreign Policy, The New York Times, Der Spiegel, The Columbia Journalism Review, and many other publications. His book, Empire of Graveyards, was first published in German under the title Der Längste Krieg 20 Jahre War and Terror with Westen Verlag. We will have about an hour for discussion and will then open up the floor for questions from the audience. So allow me to start with our first question. Um, and I would suggest that we, you know, you, with this first one, um, Maybe we can go in the order of uh, Anna, Imran, Hanna, and Sarah, and then from there on, though, you can always go ahead as you like and uh, contribute. How do you situate yourself in relation to Palestine in German speaking worlds? How do you experience and encounter manifestations of erasure? Hanna, if you like to start. Oh, Anna, sorry. Um, how do I situate myself? Um, well, as someone born to a white German mother and a Palestinian father, I do situate myself as a German Palestinian, if, if that's the question. Um, and how do I experience erasure? Um, well, uh, I guess from a personal perspective, this erasure comes with, um, an inability almost in speaking in a symbolic realm um, in public, um, having troubles finding people to uh, publish you <laughs> or um, only publish you with a certain limitation on wording and political analysis, um, which made me retract many um, manuscripts already. Um, yeah, I think for Germany, it is kind of a um, almost default mechanism to write Palestinians out of the nation um, in many ways, um, which we can discuss, I guess, a lab more elaborately um, once this, con this conversation continues. But um, I think by now, a more international audience has understood that Germany's political stance as a country is that of unconditional solidarity with Israel, which obviously then mirrors a... Uh, non-existent or only partial and conditional, um, if at all, solidarity with Palestine or Palestinians. So we are in many ways written out of this nation um, based on the premise of supporting Israel, which is precisely the transnational locus that I'm also interested in. So should I just continue, I guess? Um, regarding my background, um, I, I was born and raised in Austria uh, by Afghan parents, and I live in Germany now for more than 10 years. So indeed, what played a huge role in in my kind of uh, political socialization was the, was 9-11 and uh, how people, how especially people from Afghanistan were framed um, after 9-11. And uh, I mean, back then I was a child, by, but it's deeply influenced me in my work. Uh, it still does until today. And uh, there are two major things which are, I think, similar to what is happening today. First of all, if you try to challenge the narratives of the war on terror in Afghanistan and elsewhere, you faced a lot of backlash and, uh, you know, a lot of erasure. And um, another thing is that um, I also when I try to connect the war on terror in Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on to places like Palestine, which is, I think, very crucial because of different things. Maybe we'll talk about it later, you know, weapon developments, how people are being threatened and so on. 
Um, that was also something that was kind of difficult also over the years when um, there was more critique towards the war in terror in Afghanistan, also in the Western world. A lot of people, especially in German speaking countries, you know, they liked that, this kind of critique more and more, but they could, they did, they did not want to see connecting the dots uh, between all these different worlds. And uh, a very prominent example of erasure uh, just happened actually. And uh, I think, uh, I think uh, it's important maybe to mention it. Uh, in, the, in the context of Afghanistan, we just saw another erasure here in Germany because uh, the German Bundestag or the so-called Enquete Commission uh, published uh, a report uh, about the war and its failures as it has been described. Uh, so it's mainly about uh, the German army and its involvement in Afghanistan. So they published uh, just a few days ago more than 300 pages and uh, they mentioned 66 German victims, so all the victims of of Germany during the 20 years of war, so mainly military personnel and so on. But they did not think it's worth mentioning, you know, almost 200,000 dead Afghans. And even the Afghan people which were directly killed because of German involvement, like in 2009, when the Kunduz airstrike took place and killed around 150 people, all civilians, and the perpetrator, uh, you know, didn't get any punishment. He was just promoted as a general 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and uh, nothing happened, no consequences. And now we have the Germans, you know, publishing this report, pretending that they learned something, something from their mistakes, but actually they didn't. And what they did is just again erasing people, erasing lives, uh, ignoring lives, ignoring victims. And I personally also connect this to what else is happening in this country right now regarding Palestine. Okay, I, I continue. Uh, so uh, when I was thinking about this question erasure and the, the amount of time we spent talking about it, um, I realized that really an important part of talking about this erasure means that there's an effort to remove something that's there, right? So I felt it's really important also to remember and remind ourselves this constant effort of removal and erasure, especially in Germany, means that we as Palestinians are actually here and there and that it's a political and epistemic effort and a political project to be removed. And then the question is, why is that? Um, and it connects to maybe questions that we will discuss later. And perhaps on a more personal level, when I thought like, when did I really realize that this erasure was happening. So uh, I remember there, and, and it's something I'm working on in a research paper right now as well, which is a sort of documentation of Israel-German school exchanges on the level of high school. And um, I participated in one of those exchanges as well. And the, the condition to be able to participate, or one of them, the one that I uh, want to talk about now, is to participate for one year in something that was called an Israel seminar. And this Israel seminar talked about everything, just not Israel. So we learned the entire history of, of the Old Testament, the New Testament, of anti-Semitism in Europe, and then the Israel seminar which was called Israel Seminar, stopped with 1948. It stopped at the creation of Israel. And then the Israel Seminar stopped and we were said, now you're ready, now you can participate in this exchange program. And this not only erases the existence of Israel, which is ironic for a class called Israel Seminar, but also it means that we can't talk about the Nakba and it means we can't talk about Palestinians and it means we can't talk about how the existence of Palestinians unsettles a German narrative, um, which these exchanges are built on. And I think, and I'm going to end with that, this is somehow mirrored also in how we are talking now about what's happening in Gaza. So you will see in the media, there's an Israel 
war on Gaza. There is a war between Gaza and Israel, but never Palestine. Palestinians are not mentioned. Palestinians don't exist. Um, and I've had this conversation recently where I was asked to contribute to a publication in German and was made like, it's similar to what you others have said, like, okay, we want like Palestinian voices to be heard. And this abstract of this planned publication didn't even mention Palestinians. So when I said, you know, if you want me to contribute to this issue, then as a Palestinian voice, then you will need to put Palestine in this abstract. And I was told, oh, that's a minor issue. It's not so important. You can do that in your contribution. And that's yet again another form of erasure. And, and right now I find it really difficult, to be honest, to be talking about erasure while a genocide is going on. And that's, I think, what brought me to, to this point of, well, uh, if there's an erasure and an effort to remove that, that means we're here. And I think we really should also look at that point and what that means, um, the counterpoint to erasure. Yeah, I'm going to end on that. But we can pick it up later in the discussion. So I think it's my turn. Um, I'm Sara El Bilbesi. I'm born to a, a Swiss mother and a Palestinian father, and um, wrote my PhD about Palestinians in Germany and Switzerland. It was it was um, an ethnography um, of my own community. So let's say it was a, an auto ethnography, and. Um, I was trying to to write about the the consequences of the erasure of Palestine and of Palestinians. I call it tabuization of the Palestinian experience of violence and also the, the tabuization of the Palestinian identity. Um, yeah, I, I was trying to write about the consequences of these tabuizations on Palestinians living in Germany and Switzerland. So it was a, a pers very personal topic I, I, I tackled. And I, um, so I discuss what affects not, not only the tabooing of Israeli state violence, but also the moral justification of Israeli state violence has on, on Palestinians in 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 Central Europe and on on their lives and on their their intergenerational intergenerational relationships and I I looked at um, two generations of migrants the, the the Palestinians who Palestinians who migrated in the 1960s mostly and in the 1980s um, I. For me, I defined them as um, first generation, first migration generation. And um, Palestinians who migrated to, to Germany and Switzerland in the 1960s um, mostly came for work and, and, and to study, but they got stuck um, there because they became refugees um, um, on the spot because they were not allowed to return home after the occupation. And Palestinians who came to migrate to Germany, mostly to Germany in the, in the 1980s, um, um, were refugees from, from the Lebanese civil war. And the second uh, generation are for me the, Palest the ch their children. So the, the Palestinians who were born in Germany and Switzerland, so my generation. And I'm trying to show how for Palestinians in exile, violence continues after their expulsion. Because the colonial experience in historical Palestine, the destruction of Palestinian um, society and identity, was continued 
on a symbolic and on a discursive level, which is now, as we see, more and more being institutionalized. And um, I show that these this um, discursive violence or this symbolic violence, which denied and justified their experience of violence and their Palestinianness, how this violence has led to, to a desubjectification of the first generation. Desubjectification for me is a dissolution of the self and uh, feelings of invisibility, of um, in isolation, melancholia, guilt, and also shame, and on the inside, but also self negation on the outside. And I show how this um, this the violence of not being seen as um, as human beings or as uh, um, grievable human beings results into a trauma which is passed on to the next generation and how this is passed on. But I also show how their children, like um, while, while the first generation is somehow trapped in, in, in their trauma, um, the second generation begins to transform this 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 uh, shame and this trauma into into agency and and re and tries to reclaim their socially rejected identity and um yeah maybe on a on a personal um how how it affected my me personally is um, of course since October uh, seven, I I I, I um, have been in the media several times, and um, I noticed that as soon as you have a certain reach or media presence, um, you're becoming perceived as a threat, and um, people try to erase your voice or start uh, defame you. But um, it affected me personally, of course, before October 7. And um, for example, when I was um, writing my PhD, I encountered a lot of resistance from lecturers at my university, but also from colleagues. And people would say that I couldn't write that as a Palestinian or yeah, someone with a Palestinian background, I couldn't write. On, on a topic related to Palestine. Thank you Thank for you. giving us so much to reflect on in those opening remarks. Um, I wanna pick up on a couple of things that have already come up in the discussion. One is when Panis was reading out uh, your bio, Anna, uh, she said that you, you you reject the way the German past is deployed in these conversations about Palestine. And I was also struck by this in, in Hannah, in your narration of the forced teaching of a certain version of Israeli history um, or, or not teaching a certain part of that history. Um, so really this is a question about German history. I'm not a German speaker, but one German word that I am familiar with as a student of memory and colonialism is uh, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, which is variously translated as working off the past, reckoning with the past, etc. Uh, and so really my question is, what does this term mean? How is this memory work performed? Uh, and what are its implications for how Palestine can and cannot be discussed in German speaking worlds? And the question is for anyone who wants to pick it up, really. Maybe I can say a short thing and then the Anna or the, yeah. I mean, I think we, we bring in different perspectives, but one thing that I think is really wrong in this idea of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, that first of all, it's possible 
to reckon with the past in Germany. And I also don't think that that ever was the intention. So I would agree that framing whatever is happening through guilt is, is factually wrong. And, um, and there is this idea that there has been a break after the Second World War, that there's a new Germany that can become good again. Um, and maybe that's a desire, but factually that there, there has never been a break after the, the war. There was a continuation in particular in the diplomatic corps. All the diplomats remained the same through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. We have laws, um, racist laws, uh, especially discriminating Sinti and Roma in Germany that stayed in place exactly the same through the 70s. So even, even independently of the question of Palestine, this idea of a break is a historical. And I think Palestine comes into focus and is a really important lens because it really, and that's why, I, and I think that's related to this first question in the opening remarks and erasure, Palestine as and Palestinians are really a hurdle in this narrative of a new Germany because it makes very clear that the expansionist colonial ideology never really ended. So I think this refusal and this not wanting to look at Israel's history after 48, which is really the beginning of Israel's history, is connected to that because then we would have to look at the um, ethnic cleansing and erasure and annihilation. Uh, and that runs counter this image of uh, Germany that became good after the war. And I think that's, there's a lot of other things to say here, but I think one important thing I want to say is why there is this constant desire really to erase Palestinians is because taking Palestinians seriously, seeing Palestinians, not invisibilizing our history really would mean that this narrative of a new Germany would become impossible to maintain. Um, and I'm going mean, to just... leave it at there. I mean, there's, yeah. Sorry, I thought you were done. Um, I'm going to jump right in because that's the perfect um, uh, kind of staging almost uh, that you gave. Thank you so much. Um, so Hannah already talked about the, the post-war period, and there's a wonderful book by Frank Stern, which is called Whitewashing the Jewish Star, <clears throat> where he essentially argues um, that in a post-reunification, uh, post-reunification, sorry, post-World War II Germany, um, the allies, along with the German establishment, political establishment, have essentially what they coined and called denazification was essentially an embrace of a philosemitic um, national politics and philosemitism is as opposed to anti-semitism the um, upheaval uh, uh, and understanding of Jews as uh, better people uh, special people smarter people etc so it's part of a racial um, structure essentially as Franz Fanon also says um, hating the black buddy or loving the black buddy for being the black buddy is essentially the same uh, coin but two different sides within a racial matrix. So that's philosemitism within a German um, political narrative, which however obviously helped on a transnational and international stage to kind of recuperate a German national understanding and political um, uh, image to the outside um, that made it possible again to reintegrate Germany in the so-called free liberal Western nation states. Um, so that's one thing. Um, then we also need to take into account that there is a huge difference between psychoanalyzing, um, aka critical theory. We go to the, the root of things. We don't, uh, there is something that presents itself on the surface, and then there's actually something that is happening behind that surface, which is uh, could be an entirely different thing, right? So um, psychologizing always leads to a certain pathologizing of people, essentially, that takes it out of a out of a larger framework and context that is always transnational and historically um, situated. Um, so we need to understand that Germans haven't had that discourse in the 60s and 70s, for instance. In the 70s, 
we see the first literature of Germans um, um, kind of coming up where German victimhood is tackled, German victimhood in from the Second World War, basically. Um, so Germans started talking, or at least writing, because talking wasn't possible then, about their own victimhood from the Nazis. Then fast forward 20 more years later, uh, we see an emerging new right um, developing and embracing this discourse and actually tapping into it by calling uh, for Germans to stop feeling ashamed and guilty and usually bringing up the, the issue of Dresden, the bombardment of civilians, um, et cetera. Um, so this discourse that we um, see uh, kind of unfolding in, in full force these days um, is uh, one that is, let's say, 20 to 30 years in the making ever since the um, end of the so-called socialist East, um, the reunification of the two uh, formerly separated Germanys. And it has to be understood and situated within a larger context of European unification. Um, so um, what, what, what happened, and, and again, I mean, I, I guess people have written about it um, as well. It's, um, 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 when Europe in the 90s tried to understand its own historical and political and um, cultural, whatever we want to call, call it, um, common identity, uh, what happened, what we saw evolving and then establishing itself in the Stockholm conference in 2001 for the, uh, uh, yeah, in 2001 for the first time, um, is that European nations uh, understood the, uh, the Holocaust and the Second World War as the founding pillar for a new Europe. Um, and with that kind of political um, understanding of a common history, which is not the common history of 500 years of colonialism, right, by the way, <laughs> um, but of a um, European history, which essentially apparently formed Europeans, um, uh, which happened solely inside of the European um, territory, right? So it recenters Europe, its history, and the worst that ever happened in Europe, uh, in the world, sorry, as well as the best that ever happened in the world, is again only analyzed through this optic of uh, a very certainly territorially bound European um, entity. Um, and what comes kind of in handily almost at this turn in 2001 and then uh, the following two years is obviously the war on terror. So we see not only a certain um, understanding of the Holocaust and Europeans being somehow the victims of the Nazis, Germans included, um, but also emerging with anti-terrorism legislation. So we see not only a coming together as white Europeans on a certain ethical, moral trope, but also a demarcation point that situates the non-Western world, in particular the Muslim terrorists at that time, as the pivotal other that needs to be um, 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 written out and kept out in, in any way possible. And that is how a long lasting colonial as well as racist narrative around Palestinians um, uh, but not only Palestinians, right? When Germans talk about their own shame, Fatima al Tayyib called it, it becomes the shame of the other. And Sarah wrote uh, a book about it as well. So it becomes the shame of Palestinians, but it's not only the shame of Palestinians. I think if there's a certain subjectivity obviously ingrained in that, but everybody who kind of stands up uh, for Palestinian rights next to their own decolonial, anti-colonial um, narratives um, is also shamed into submission. So that's not necessarily only a particular Palestinian problem, but I think the Palestinian occupies a very particular role in bringing together these narratives um, between the East and the West, uh, border politics, um, as well as the weaponization of race. It's not the weaponization of anti-Semitism, by the way, to my mind, this is what people always say. It's the weaponization of race because um, there's a multi-directional moment that kind of brushes everyone over the same uh, comp in a way, um, uh, uh, obviously with the Palestinian figure as the, the main culprit that um, instigates these kind of decolonial rhetorics, supposedly. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to stop it at that. Uh, yeah. um, shall I continue? Or um, I yeah I would also yeah I would say we the term 
Vergangenheitsbewältigung. The German term is appropriate, I would say, but not the English translation of it, dealing with the past. In German, you have this, I don't know, I don't really know how to translate Vergangenheitsbewältigung, but there is the, literally, maybe you can help me, but there is the, there is, it has the word violence in it, Bewältigung. So, um, and I think um, there is the, the, the attempt to, to master history, to master it, its past. But there is no a real attempt to deal with its past. And there is um, an interesting study of a German, written by a German sociologist, Harald Welzer, um, with the title, My Translator, My Grandpa was not a Nazi. And he actually shows how, um, how there is no um, confrontation on a personal level with with the with um the deeds of the the generation of the grandparents and as Anna said they are it's rather a tendency that of victimization that they rather victimize their grandparents as either victims of the system or of Hitler or of a war and um and this um so instead of a personal um dealing with the past there is an institutionalization of, of this dealing with the past, institutionalization, which is instrumentalized for, um, for identity politics and memory politics, um, um, for, for, with the goal of yeah, this new post-war nation building. Um, and then, of course, we have the the dogma of the of the singularity of the Holocaust, which is um, which is uh, strongly shaping this kind of um, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Um, and the historian Dirk Moses um, called um, called it um, a German catechi catechism, uh, meaning that the Holocaust is. Um, uh, the, the dogma which is saying that the Holocaust is not comparable or shouldn't be compared to, to any other genocide in world history, even those genocides perpetrated by the Germans themselves. And through this, um, through this um, the Holocaust is removed, is being removed from history and, um, and turned into, into a state of of, of um, exception um, without without predecessors and without structural r racism in in the present and um, this is actually very uh, historical because um, it 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 neglects or it denies the fact that anti-Palestinian racism and anti-Semitism are strongly intertwined, as the Nakba is strong is, is closely intertwined with the history of National Socialism. Um, but nevertheless, the expulsion of the Palestinians and the Holocaust are not thought of as parts of the same historical process. So this dogma of, of the singularity of the Holocaust also uh, splits or separates um, um, two aspects of, 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 of one history or of one historical process and, um, and uh, serves as a, as a mechanism to, to, to exclude um, um, the Palestinian shadow history of of the yeah of the Holocaust and and I would say I mean we 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 all the time we speak about Germany but but as um as someone who was raised in Switzerland um and worked um her whole life in Germany I I have to say that the discourses in Germany and Switzerland are very similar 
and Switzerland, Switzerland, the, the Switzerland shares this repress shares this um shares an involvement in the Holocaust because it it cooperated economically with with the Nazis and it have, it had a very restrictive refugee policy, but it it shares also with with Germany that it that it this is a past which has also not really been worked through. And um yeah. That's from my side. Yeah, but you a bit like the sound is not um ideal. I hope it's better now. Yeah, now it's better. Okay, if you can't understand me, just uh, let me know. So, yeah, as Sada already said, um, it's uh, she was born, she was she, she was talking about the uh, Swiss discourse. Uh, I can just uh, add some stuff from Austria. So, I think in Austria it's even worse because uh, Austria still has this narrative that uh, it was the first victim of the Nazis because of the so-called Anschluss. Uh, Austria still, you know, many parts of Austrian society, political landscape and so on, also in school and, you know, the, the way I grew up with it. It was often said, even I remember how, how my history teacher in school told us, yeah, listen, you know, actually, I mean, he was very left-wing, so he said, listen, um, these things happened, but in our society here in Austria, uh, we still victimize ourselves. We still say that we were the first victims of the Nazis. And um, so for that reason, you could see a lot of problematic things very early in, in the modern history of Austria. Like, um, you know, the so-called Freedom Party of Austria, which is a, a far right political party, uh, is not something new. Like you have the AFD uh, in Germany, um, which... Uh, you know, was founded kind of like uh, it evolved during the last 10 years, 10, 12 years, something like that. Uh, in Austria, you had the Freedom Party, which mainly, you know, the first members of it were just old Nazis after after the Second World War. And you still uh, and you, you had a lot of uh, Nazism within the party, but it was a very well established party uh, until today. You have a lot of neo-Nazi elements within the Freedom Party of Austria. During the last years, we had a vice chancellor who was from the Freedom Party. He actually had a neo-Nazi past. Uh, Heinz Christian Strache had uh, a neo-Nazi past. Uh, everything is written. It's not like, you know, I'm just talking out of the air or something. It's, everything is factual and uh, very well known. But this guy just became uh, you know, vice chancellor of Austria. And now you have the Freedom Party again on the rise. And uh, by the way, it fell because of a corruption scandal a few years ago, the so-called Ibiza affair. Um, so it was during the coalition of the Freedom Party and the Conservative Party, which also became very, very right wing. And um, they fell because of corruption scandal, not because of all the neo-Nazi stuff, because of the racism, because of the uh, uh, Islamophobia and so on. So... Uh, that's also, in my opinion, as an Austrian, because I'm also, I consider myself also as an Austrian, not just an African, you know, part of Austrian society. I think that Austrian society has a lot of problems and it says a lot about the society when they don't care, major parts of it don't care about the Nazi past, the racism and so on, but they just freak out and bring their government down when, when they see, okay, um, they are corrupt. So um, these are my two cents on this. Let me think if I forgot something important. I mean, yes, uh, what, what was also ridiculous, and, uh, what you could see during the last 20 years, especially within the Freedom Party, was how um, they, you know, for example, leading officials of the party went to Israel and expressed their solidarity uh, with uh, the Israeli politics uh, against the Palestinians and they just did it because they knew uh, they could get away with it 
uh, use it for their own policies against migrants, refugees, and Muslims. You see similar trends within other far-right parties. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's also part of, you know, part of the bigger uh, picture. Can, can I Thank jump you. in? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think what um, Imran was just saying, I, I would like to say something about Germany in that regard. Um, when when Sarah was talking about uh, uh, public versus private memory um, and and the so-called Vergangenheitsbewältigung, for which we don't really have a proper English translation, um, but working through the past. Um, and and when I when I basically mentioned that the 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 right capitalized on this victimhood and shame and guilt trope. Um, uh, prior to, but then it spiraled into a very important force in the 90s after reunification. Um, it is uh, very important to mention that the AFD, for instance, which is our right-wing uh, party in Germany, um, was, for instance, also the first one that um, uh, brought in the motion uh, of an anti-BDS, um, an anti-BDS motion basically to the parliament um, and not any of the other uh, party fractions, which doesn't, which doesn't mean that the other party fractions uh, didn't follow suit a month later, um, proposing their own anti-BDS legislation. Um, but it is important because uh, the AFD peddles the discourse of getting over uh, the guilt and the shame of the past, um, closing it off, by um, showing a um, uh, Ottoman support of Zionism. Um, funnily enough, the first party in Germany which mainstreamed anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, so the, equal, the equalizing of both, essentially was actually the left-wing party and not the right-wing party. That's just um, a side note to show that we're very much uh, beyond post-politics in that regard, and it's a structure that governs uh, um, uh, the public discourse, not the private one necessarily, but the public discourse. Uh, but the private discourse kind of um, uh, uh, follows suit in this narrative of guilt and shame that we have to come to an end with in a way, which is essentially from its very inception, one of not having worked through the past, which then became a right-wing discourse and is now in a way a liberal discourse of all parties. Thanks. Uh, you've, you've all given us a lot, lot to think about. Um, in some ways, we've been having quite a reflection on Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. But many of you have also brought up um, global frames, such as the war on terror. Uh, Imran, you mentioned that, and uh, and also these dynamics of racialization, which. Uh, indeed look very familiar in other Western contexts. So I suppose one question I've been thinking about is how do these German-speaking world-specific factors interact with those global frames? Is, in other words, is the German-speaking world simply a more extreme version of dynamics that are evident more widely? Uh, is that how we should understand it rather than exceptionalizing it and its experience, um, and to use the term that Sarah used. So again, in any order, whoever wants. I can start. Okay. Just, uh, yeah, I think that uh, you started in a very good way, Rahul. I think it's more, uh, the German speaking world is uh, a more, you know, more radical in this term and uh, more popular, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you see, you see a very a deeply questionable framing regarding uh, the events in Palestine in all in almost all media outlets. So, um, you know, if I I don't follow what is happening in the Middle East uh, on German media, I just use German media to take a look how stupid it and uh, how ignorant it has become again so i have you know all these new stickers from uh, well-established media outlets also to be honest some of the outlets i'm also writing for and um, i feel ashamed uh, to be kind of considered as part of this uh, as a german uh, as journalist reporting in in german 
and for German media outlets because uh, you see so many ridiculous things and uh, it becomes embarrassing also like you know people for media people from the outside from other countries who see that and uh, they are just like you know what the hell is going on there there is really a new level uh, when it comes to ignorance and erasing and just you know um parroting idf propaganda uh parroting you know just official stage uh, official official state journalism and so on just a lot of it all over but you at the same time you see that also many other uh prestigious media outlets like the new york times and so on also face a lot of criticism because they themselves they also participate in dehumanization, erasing voices and so on, and you know, framing certain things in a, in a certain context. You could also see this on the, in the past. I mean, for example, uh, in the past, the Washington Post and the New York Times um, made a lot of uh, mistakes, you can say, uh, when reporting about civilian casualties and the war on terror, especially, especially, for, uh, especially regarding growth strikes. I remember how I wrote some stuff about how they just uh, misreported things and uh, portrayed actual civilian uh, victims as terrorists, militants, and whatsoever. And after these things have been exposed, these big uh, media outlets uh, did not care to correct what they said. So, yes, I think uh, it's an overall problem. But if you want to see how ridiculous and stupid it's could become just take a look at what is happening in Germany, especially in Germany. I think. Um, yeah, I totally. Oh, Hannes, go ahead. I, I think Hannah was, yeah, Nathan, and then uh, Anna. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think also we're we're all going to like add to each other, but I wanted for a moment to go back with in relation to this question, also to the to the overall issue of um, erasure and how different kinds of erasure come together. And it has to do with also a way of how a discourse is happening in Germany and elsewhere. Um, so one of the things that I realize in the past months more than even before that for scholars to like a tribe I belong to reluctantly, it seems to be so much an issue of discourse and using Palestine as a discourse to prove or disprove certain theories of um, morality and and I think it's really important to look back at, back at like that the epistemic erasures that are happening to all of us. And Sara and Anna also elaborated on on the issue of being cancelled, not invited, on supervisors having issues with your topic, telling you not to research it. And I think we've all experienced that. So there is this sort of silencing erasure and being ignored on an epistemic level within these universities. But that is absolutely linked to the physical, geographic, and historical erasure um, in Palestine. And I think now it becomes really urgent uh, to look at that and to realize how not a single German university has published a statement in solidarity with scholars or institutions in Gaza at a time where every single university in Gaza has been destroyed or partially destroyed. The museums have been looted, the libraries have been looted or destroyed, and the documents have been removed um, in a process that is very similar to what happened in 1948 and following that up until today, um, a form of erasure is that our documents can be found in the Israeli National Library. So if we want to research maps of um, this time, uh, we, we have, so this is a sort of continuation. I don't think we can separate this erasure on a discursive level from this erasure that's happening and the killing that is happening in Gaza and the rest of Palestine. So I think this is also a form of erasure to narrow it down only to Gaza because that's the most extreme Thing, as if we can't see what's happening also in the West Bank, it has been ongoing intensified depopulation of villages, destruction of homes, I think up to 
20, I'm not sure of the exact number because it keeps increasing, but it's at least 15 villages in the West Bank that have been complete, completely depopulated only since October. Uh, so it's so these questions and debates that we're having, whether it, it's OK or whether it's too extreme to talk of ethnic cleansing, are really absurd when we look at the things that are actually happening. And, um, and just to. To, yeah. Close on that point, I think when we're asking about racism, uh, anti-Palestinian racism, what we can really see here is by refusing to see Palestinians, by refusing to acknowledge the humanness of Palestinians, of course, we can't see the physical erasure. Because if we already refused and uh, and analyzed Palestine out of a discourse in Germany and elsewhere, then we can't actually see the things that are happening anymore because we've already removed them from a level of understanding and existence. So I think we need to put those two things together and really understand that all these discourses that we're having have real material effects on the ground. They're not abstract academic discussions we're having. I mean, maybe it's probably obvious to all of you, but I think we should state that, yeah. If it works for everyone, we can open now um, the space for questions from our audience. Um, can, I, can I can I briefly please, add please something? Ahead. Of course, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. I think what is really important to kind of take Germany out of this, you know, supposedly pathological state that everybody is kind of imposing it on 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 this the exceptionalism that that is Germany, right? So now we heard from Austria and Switzerland that it's not that much different. Um, and again, the war on terror is a very pivotal point to mention here. In my work, I connected not only to the war on terror, by the way, but also to the war on drugs. And um, what is particular? So. In, in 2000 and 2001, uh, what was very foundational within German-only centric politics was that we had a new citizenship law emerging, which made um, what we would call people of color. In Germany, it's called migrants, so to say, uh, generations of uh, um, um, undocumented. No, well, not undocumented. That's not true. But, you know, people grew up here in second generations um, of, you know, Arabs or Palestinians or Turks, and they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to hold German citizenship. So this change in law made it possible for a large part of that population to be able to apply for citizenship law. So that's one thing. Um, uh, the outbreak of the Second Intifada, the war on terror, as well as the Durban Conference on Racism um, all happened more or less around the same time, the 2000s until 2003. Um, and that is where we see an institutionalization, what you know can be called maybe educational warfare, um, being targeted um, against uh, not only uh, populations of color, in particular Muslim populations, but also um, reframing a, a conversation for white Germans as to how to talk about Israel, uh, Germany's past, as well as anti-Semitism. Again, writing out Palestine entirely in its history. Um, so when it comes to a certain kind of um, uh, uh, special nexus that Germany represents, um, just yesterday, the uh, Palestine legal um, people have published a report on how uh, the uh, war on terror and the anti-terrorism legislation has been um, deeply anti-Palestinian already since the 70s. So 68, 67 onwards, essentially. So most of the anti-terrorism legislation that we see coming out of the United States of America, which was uh, many of them have been uh, mainstreamed uh, with uh, European intelligence services and politics as well. As you all know, we all bombed Iraq, essentially, and Afghanistan um, have been mainstreamed and um, uh, uh, built on anti-Palestinian racisms. And I can maybe read a little bit of it for those people who are not familiar with it. The first mention, that's Palestine Legal. Uh, again, it was published yesterday. Uh, the first mention of terrorism in a federal statute in 1969 dealt specifically with restricting humanitarian aid to Palestinians. That's one example. Second, the first U.S. government terrorism blacklist was championed by Israel supporters and has been used primarily against governments supporting Palestinian resistance. Third, 
The first and only time Congress has designated a group as terrorist organization was in 1987, um, aimed at the Palestine Liberation Organization. Fourth, the first immigration law to include terrorism as a basis for exclusion and deportation singled out the PLO. Um, I would like to remind everyone here that last year um, there was also an appeal uh, within Congress in the US to actually um, uh, take citizenship away from Palestinian terrorists, so to say, or Palestinians in general. We have the same debates essentially since 2001 in Germany. Um, and the fifth one, um, can I can also speak to Germany in that regard. Although the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing was perpetrated by domestic extremists, the anti-terrorism provisions passed in its wake, including the one criminalizing material support, targeted only foreign groups with Palestinians as primary focus. So um, what we do see in the in the in the wake of uh, the war on terror, essentially uh, taking a, a globalized uh, route, let's say, right, uh, being implemented in various states, not only in the Western world, um, usually through its governing elites, um, uh, uh, has materialized in a, a globalized repression of Palestine and Palestinian resistance. Um, so what is particular maybe uh, to Germany is that what we see in this um, Discourse. The discourse is obviously always material as well, even if you're the craziest Bacodian, um, is that we see uh, surveillance laws, uh, money laundering laws, immigration law, criminal law, military law being applied. And now actually, now that we see international law, also na international law, at least from the US American side, being applied in order to wage lawfare against Palestine, Palestinians, and Palestinian resistance from Palestine to the United States to, to, to Germany uh, or Europe. What is particular about Germany then, and I wrote a piece last year actually on that, is that we see these anti-terrorism laws merge in Germany, um, not necessarily only on the premise of anti-Semitism, that's what everybody does. Everybody's an anti-Semite, everybody thinks, or most Western populations believe that Palestinians are inherently anti-Semitic and terrorists, but it is merged with anti-Nazi laws as well. So maybe that's the particularity of the German context that we now have anti-Nazi laws, which have been reserved for a very long time until recently, predominantly to deal with Nazis, um, are now used to legally wage lawfare um, against Palestinians here. And I can also give you a short, um, another example of a publication which was published in December 2023 by the police in Nordrhein-Westfalen, which is one of the federal states um, uh, of Germany. Um, and in this brochure, which they hand out to schools, for instance, um, they advise the students, the teachers, as well as the parents to um, uh, bring to the uh, to basically sue or bring to the awareness of the police the criminalization or the criminal acts of Palestinian students. I'm here talking again about minors, right? This is a school situation, and um, the criminal law. There's criminal law. I've been I've been a, a legal what's it called a legal judge in um, in youth courts for five years now, and I've never seen anything like that. Um, there's criminal law being waged against Palestinian students that, for instance, if they wear a kafia or um, say Palestine um, will be free. This is a support for a terrorist organization. Another one is, for instance, posting pictures of um, the first day when on the 7th of, of October, which all, we've all seen uh, the, um, uh, uh, the tractor um, going through the fence in Gaza, that would be um, a, a, an endorsement of violence and also punishable by law. Um, incitement to genocide, if you say that what is happening today um, in, in Gaza is, geno is genocide, that you actually commit incitement to genocide against Jews. Um, so we are here talking about the criminalization of minors with criminal law, which is um, kind of tantamount to writing out youth, youth law um, out for these people. Essentially, youth law, youth courts are there to educate and the reprimations of young people under the age of 18 and 20, uh, 21 is very restricted. So now here we are calling, or the police calls, for young students wearing a kafia to be tried for terrorism uh, when they say this is genocide for an incitement to genocide against Jews um, in a way that I've never seen before and basically treats them already as terrorist anti-Semite Nazis um, without taking into account that they're, that they're still minors, right? So this is kind of uh, one of the things that I can just bring in as, as an example um, as to how um, kind of 
particular, but yet also kind of streamlined with a general Western tendency within Europe and the Western world um, that we see unfolding basically in the criminalization of of Palestinians, which are predominantly now come to be ruled um, by criminal law, immigration law, military law in Israel-Palestine, as well as surveillance and policing technologies. So if I can just try and sum up the mind-boggling contradictions we're encountering here, we are we are seeing a conflation of anti a use of anti-terrorism laws merged with anti-Nazi laws. And at the same time, the real Nazis, whether in the AFD or the Freedom Party, are making common cause with the Zionists. And that's the kind of uh, um, moment that we're situated in, I guess. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Paniz now, because I think you have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much, Rahul. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I, I just like also to quickly follow up on Anna. I think the importance of what you also invite us to think about is the ways in which we use language, the ways in which we use pathologizing language, the ways in which the racialized are being right um, pathologized. I do think it still leaves open the question of th thinking, for instance, as the psychopath, not only as embodied in the figure of an individual, right? Right, But how it materializes in structures that are basically made to seem um, uh, legal, made to seem life affirming, while they're actually um, geared towards reorganizing social and political life in ways that are actually detrimental to um, social and political life. But j just out there as a way to think about, you know, this as a, also a site of contention, the ongoing question to actually how to speak about the level of perversion that you uh, so, so importantly just laid out for us. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, we have one uh, question about uh, the anti deutsch I would like to share with you um, from Miriam. Thank you all for this interesting discussion. I would love to hear your take on the so-called Anti-Deutsche in Germany and wonder whether there are equivalent groups in Switzerland and Austria. Um, the Anti-Deutsche? Oh no, I don't think so. Um, Yes, Ra um, sorry, Imran. She was just asking about the anti Deutsche, right? I'm sorry, I, I don't know, at least I don't know, but I, I think this is a, a very German phenomenon. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I don't. We can't. Yeah, that's better. I said in Austria, I mean, of course, they're not as organized as in Germany, but in Austria, you can also find uh, anti Deutsche. I think at uh, the University of Vienna, uh, it's, they're quite, um, I mean, they're there for years, and now it's their time, I would say, because. Uh, what these extremists are saying, uh, you know, they have been the in very early stage. They were canceling people, attacking people, Palestinians, Muslims. I remember many, some years ago, I, I think it was like seven, eight years ago, I was invited to Frankfurt to talk about my book back then. And these anti deutsch they're often very organized uh, within universities. I'm sure Anna knows this better. Uh, and uh, then they try to take your room away and, uh, you know, they, they are very good at uh, screenshotting and using screenshots against you, uh, whatever you say, taking out of context, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, a very radical group, a very extremist group. I totally detest them. I have to say this here. And, um, and yeah, but they're also in Austria. And the, the, the sad thing is that these people... 
they are now the the, the views of the anti Deutsche they are, they, are, they are, the views have become very ma mainstream now. You know the the main slogan of the anti Deutsche was uh, free Gaza from Hamas, uh, and now you see free Gaza from Hamas uh, everywhere, uh, without any context and you know any historical details. Blah blah blah. Uh, it's just you know they're everywhere now. Yeah, I would I would also say, I mean, it's um, the anti-Deutsche are not only a German phenomena. Um, they've kind of sent their people definitely Heimensreich uh, <laughs> to Austria. Um, uh, and, and there is a very interesting intellectual back and forth, in fact, um, of, uh, yeah, it's essentially an, an elite project which um, came came up and came out at the same time that the neo-Nazi movements in Western Germany try to kind of reconfigure themselves in the 90s. Um, so yeah, today I I was just recently um, at a children's bookstop around the corner from my place that I actually like to frequent and now not anymore um, because they have uh, um, put out stickers uh, from a nearby um, commemoration site, um, Nazi yeah second world war nazi commemoration signed and one of the stickers very tellingly said free um um free uh, i need to take it i need to find it right now it's it's in it's over there but anyways uh free uh uh raza from hamas um from from raza to israel to berlin so there is a very direct transnational understanding of what and who hamas is apparently um, that's that's one thing, and uh, very much like the um, um, neo-Nazi elite that moved to the so-called former East, as we would call it, in the '90s, in the beginning and mid '90s, to um, establish its roots mm -hmm. in youth centers, for instance, as well as in marginalized, um, low-income areas. Um, the anti-Deutsche had literally the same uh, way to go to influence people. Um, and today they are very much an elite group um, that has, they're all our generation that are now occupying positions of power from politics to media to um, university chairs. Um, uh, they are anti-Semitism commissioners. I mean, the entire anti-Semitism commission um, situation in Germany is, essentially anti-Deutsch. So if if I was if I was to speak with Marx, I would say this is the new German ideology. <laughs> um, and um, you know, very, very much top down. Um, and I also wanted to say something to what Kani said as how can we psychically understand and what kind of language can we use to grapple with or or name or frame what is happening right now. And White supremacy is schizophrenia. It's not neurosis. <laughs> you know, that would be, you know, I don't, I would need to think about what actually, what, what, what is the neurosis and nationalism, I think, maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's schizophrenic because it cuts off a certain part of humanity, right? So there needs to be a schizophrenic moment um, that is being endorsed in order to pivot white supremacy over the course of 500 years to make killing and erasing and writing out possible. And psychosis usually is the moment um, where everybody goes, you know, um, crazy for everyone to see, right? So maybe we can call a genocide happening of psychosis. Psychosis essentially is something where you know, just like schizophrenia, where reality and fantasy are collapsed into each other and the person cannot um, differentiate between the two anymore, right? Um, so that's that's my, my last take on white supremacy and white supremacy essentially makes the right wing possible, right? White supremacy is not the end game. White supremacy makes right wing extremism possible, not the other way around, which is how we usually learn it in school. <laughs> So maybe that's the, the the analogy then here between white supremacy as being schizophrenia and right wing extremism and its foundational form of genocide and expulsion is the psychotic moment which we are witnessing right now in, in Gaza and Palestine. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, Rahul, please go ahead. Um, I, I'm 
just thinking about what you said, Anna, about white supremacy, because uh, as all of you have been talking, I've been wondering about the place of whiteness in this debate. Uh, and I've been thinking about that also because of Namibia's interventions in uh, the ongoing um, discussions at the ICJ and its reminder of Germany's completely inadequate reckoning with the genocide against the Nama and the Herero in the first decade of the 20th century. Um, and you also mentioned um, the, the whitening of Jewishness, perhaps, as part of this process. So I, I wondered if you could comment on these racial dynamics in, in helping us to understand how we've come to this present moment. Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump in now. I don't know. <laughs> um, so the whitening of Jewishness, I mean, essentially, whiteness is always conditionally conferred, right? You're not born white. You become white as kind of like a woman or, you know, gender, sexuality, la, la, la. What manifests it is obviously the structure that was already set in place that will then treat you better as a man, as a white person, and, and so on. Um, so whitening of a Jewish community in, in bit large, right, in the post-unification Germany um, essentially happened through the narration and endorsement of Zionism. So what Germans today or Europeans and Westerners generally think um, uh, is that the right Jew, um, the one that is treated as what we would call white, um, is one who is Zionist, which is essentially um, a white supremacist ideology to begin with. Um, uh, Zionism is white supremacy. It is rooted in, in, in white supremacy. It was um, uh, come, the idea of it is a very white German Protestant um, uh, uh, historical notion. It was not even invented by Jews back then. Um, so I think we just kind of see the historical trajectory eventually um, taking shape through the Holocaust eventually and the crimes that the Nazis have committed. Um, but that still didn't lead to Jews being whitened uh, or being white, not immediately, right? It, it, it's literally the state project that is Israel, which has contributed to this whitening effect. And the state project is Zionism. Um, so that's one thing. And um, another thing, which is a, a particularly um, crude in many ways, I think also um, uh, a Jewish scholar that I that I really like, he made an argument once that the reason why so many U.S. American Jews, young people, um, are endorsing Zionism is because there's so little left of what Jewishness could mean to them otherwise as a diaspora framing. Um, and that, again, has a lot to do with the erasure and genocide that has taken place against the Jewish communities in Europe um, for such a long time. So if you don't have an idea of what it means to be Jewish anymore because of assimilation, assimilation is yet another form of genocide, um, you look at stateness and state power to understand yourself, right? This is how we, the optics of the state is the way through which we very often understand ethnicity as well as race. Um, so that's one of the pitfalls of, you know, um, Judaism and how Jewishness is possible to be lived um, by young Jews in the Western world. So it needs a lot of unlearning and looking away and actually studying also Jewish history to come up with a non-whitened Zionist narrative of Jewishness. Um, and yeah, and I think there's obviously those people who endorse that narrative. Um, uh, you know, if you're conditionally granted entrance into whiteness, that means you're conditionally granted entrance into power. So who would reject that after centuries of persecution and and, um, and ghettoization, right? So, um, but yeah, I would, I would say that Jews are, you know, kind of on the cusp in general. And then depending on how they come out politically, I mean, as a political person, they are then cast out again um, into our folds of people of color or endorsed as um, one of the white liberal subjects that can speak on global politics. There is a great follow-up question. We will go slightly over time, but we got permission to do so. So um, if everyone is on board, we, we go slightly over time. 
um, you, yeah, is everybody on working? Cool. Um, follow up for Anna from Samuel. Could you also maybe talk more about a kind of uh, blackening um, in quotation marks he put it of Palestinians and this ongoing racialization happening in the um, Israeli project that also Israeli he also put in quotation marks. I mean, Agred Said wrote about it, right? And in, in many ways, the first people who really endorsed um, Orientalism were European Jews who kind of tried to get rid of their stigma as um, Schwarze Chayes, the, 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 the black animals that Jews were called in Europe for such a long time. And one way to do that was to endorse Orientalism. Orientalism kind of turned the white subject in general, even its minorities, in this case, Jews, into, into white people the minute they endorse colonialism and the repression of others. So that's the European lens, right? Um, so Palestinians have already been blackened, if you want to say that, you know, for a very long time, along with many other people, because white supremacy puts us into a racial matrix where we see everything between black and white, and the rest is kind of collapsed and, and erased in between, including indigeneity, um, people of color very often, right? So there's only this black or white narrative discursively functioning as a as, as semantics, but also as materialized in law or politics. Um, and the blackening um, or the whitening of the Israeli state project. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of interesting, isn't it? You have black Jews today that are um, or Arab Jews as well that are very much um, endorsing Israeli uh, Zionist colonialism. Precisely because if you are in a position of a minority, just as European Jews were in a position of minority to prove themselves to the state, um, are endorsing it even more. So when you go to a checkpoint in Palestine and you encounter a white Ashkenazi dude with his heritage from Germany or France or um, England or whatever, you will most likely encounter less violence and less um, demeaning uh, 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 behavior. Then when you encounter a woman, a black Jew, or even a Druze <laughs> um, that are in the army. So um, I think blackening and whitening are larger understandings for us to understand how race functions globally. But then we always need to zoom in and look at how that actually unfolds because black people, no matter if you're Jewish or not, are highly discriminated in Israel. Arab Jews are highly discriminated in Israel. And the same kind of happened in Europe, right? You had Jews trying to whiten themselves through Orientalist discourse, and then um, they were still uh, eventually killed and deported anyways. So I don't know if that answered the question, but um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, th there are several questions um, that are inquiring about future possibilities. So we would like to use, we, we kind of try to summarize all those questions that are asking about the future um, uh, to also wrap up our conversation. And if you like, you know, you can uh, briefly, I'm sorry, it's, it's, I know it's hard to reply to the question of the future briefly, but because we're um, a bit uh, late now to this question, each of you, if you like, but don't feel obliged, you know, to, to reply to it. Um, what can we do apart from educating ourselves to fight against the genocide of Palestinians and the attempted erasure of Palestine? What can we do not as an act of charity, but because it is our responsibility? What are your thoughts on that? I'm going to also give like the way in which it one of our um, people, our uh, comrades in the audience formulated it. Um, Anna wrote, if uh, Germany needs to continue erasing the Palestinian uh, and Palest the presence of Palestine and Palestinians to keep its troubled identity intact, there is now and supposedly more so in the future, a considerable part of the residents who are strongly pro-Palestine. What does this mean for the future of Germany and its politics?
perhaps it's a symptom of the time that we we don't know the answer to that kind of future oriented question um and it's the question we're sitting with but if if people have thoughts on that it would be great to hear Sorry, I always have problems with future oriented questions. I think, yeah, I think, I mean, there's so many things. Future, futurity is, is one of the things that I think about a lot in my work. And I think something really struck so weird. And I think there are several questions that one is the question of, of uh, Germany and like pro Palestine. I don't think the question is so much about being pro Palestine, but being about being about like a form of humanity and I don't think it work like you can't be pro some people's lives and not pro other people's lives either you are for the survival of humans or you're against it you can't like take it's not a candy shop where you can be like oh I'm for the survival of Americans and these people and, and no that doesn't work so I think also connected to this question so what can we do I think really take seriously that we're all in this together right we, the, the sound and then I don't mean this in it like oh let's all like dance together and uh, have a party but really take seriously the political implications of what it means that as humans and we can go back to the first anti-colonial thinkers like a, a society that lets any part of humanity be divided out of humanity is a rotten uh, society um paraphrasing that a bit so really it's also about about it's actually quite selfish to be um pro to support people's right to live right because if you don't support other people's right to live you forego and foreclose your own uh that's one another thing is about future and i think a main part of future is really the present and countering erasure because if we don't do that then there is no future regardless of what it may look like and this brings me back to um can uh what uh like what can we do and i think one very main thing is even before education is to speak out we all will say wrong things and stupid things in the process and i think this fear of saying wrong things prevents people from speaking out against injustice so maybe you'll speak out wrongly and i've had this discussion in relation to genocide where people were like oh but maybe it's not a genocide and we need to wait another couple of years for this uh, court to finish their debate and then only then can we use this word and i would answer to that no because wouldn't you rather be on the side of history where you said now let's stop this genocide and the killing stopped and maybe in 10 years you will find out oh, it wasn't a actually a genocide after all it was something else but then you will have prevented the killing of people so i don't really think we need to of course we need to educate ourselves but also also i think when i'm thinking about future we need to let go of this fear of making a mistake and being uncomfortable for the people around us. And really, especially if we're not being bombarded, then being okay with being uncomfortable is the least that all of us can do. Yeah. Sarah, did you, did you want to say something? Please go no. ahead. Uh, whoever like likes to. Uh... Um, obviously, no one can predict the future, but we can kind of maybe mm, um, assume, let's say, from what from what's already there, right? And on the one hand, there is a very globalized repression um on on Palestine and Palestinian resistance um on the one hand and then there is a very globalized support for the freedom and resistance of Palestinians right and both of these um uh, uh movements let's say happen I don't want to say they don't happen in the global north but they hope they happen on an institutional and nation-state level in the global south um, and on a movement-based level 
uh, very much in the global north. Um, so there is the possibility that in the global north that is now kind of tightening its grip on surveillance, um, tracking, um, incarceration, expulsion of refugees, its grip on um, what it deems to be its right. Um, so that's one scary prospect. I think we really see this technology um, raining in on us these days. Um, and I think the only way to kind of fight against it, as Hannah already said, um, anti-colonial or anti-fascist wars, for me, that's the same thing, um, have always been scary. Um, intellectuals have been shot in prison, movements been erased, genocides took place. Um, so fighting colonial powers or fascist powers is always a very scary thing. But if we don't do it, what will happen for the next generation? And I think um, everyone has to answer to themselves these days because the drones that are used in Palestine and have been developed in Palestine have been used in Afghanistan, they have been used in Yemen and Iraq, they have been used in Africa, they're being used. Actually, skunk water, for instance, is being used in the US. I don't know if they've already used it, they definitely bought it, for instance. So the technology that comes out of the United States and Israel, for instance, uh, war technology, surveillance technology, is one that essentially will come home to roost if it hasn't already come home to roost anyways. Um, the Heron drone is also the one that is surveilling the Mediterranean Sea um, against Im illegal immigrants. Um, so we're not just talking about Palestine. I think Palestine right now opens up a portal um, for us to speak about um, decolonizing the state, um, the economy with its various supply chains, right, from Palestine to Standing Rock, um, as well as the law and how we are using it transnationally as well as nationally. Um, so it's more of a, a conversation about decolonization for everyone involved right now. And, and we see the fronts developing. So now it's up to people to decide if they want to fight this war or want to live in a, a bleak future of more authoritarian rule. If uh, Sarah, did you want to say something? Um, I just wanted to, yeah, to say what that what troubles me a lot is the amount of 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 cowardness of coward people I'm <laughs> I'm I'm confronted with and or who are who are um, willing to submit to this authoritarian or fascist um yeah tendency we see and um these are also people who are explicitly for uh, for for the Palestinian cause like they on on one on one on one side they are you know of them that they are very explicitly pro palestine but on the other side if if you see how they act on the ground, then um, there is a lot of cowardness. So um, actually, to transform this um, this solidarity into into concrete action, and um, I don't really know how to how to deal with this phenomenon. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, how to deal with 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 the um, with the refusal to to really stand for what you believe in, and um, yeah. Thank you. The thermite, Imran John. Yeah, many important things have already been said. Maybe just uh, to, to wrap this up, being a bit optimistic, and I'm not so, I'm not, often I'm not really optimistic, but uh, what I noticed during the last uh, weeks and months is that, uh, as Anna already said, uh, there is uh, a global organized fight to, get, to challenge uh, these narratives we have been talking about. And I can see this everywhere. And I think it's very different than it was uh, 
after 9-11, uh, you see a lot of organized resistance uh, within debates, within the media landscape, within social media and so on, uh, that challenges these narratives. And you see a lot of people supporting each other like we do here right now. So I think that's something that we should not forget. And hopefully we will uh, benefit from this in future to make, to shape a better future. On this note, thank you. I would like to thank uh, the audience for staying patiently with us. My apologies that we went over time. Thank you for still uh, being with us, for having listened. I would like to just send all of you on the panel, uh, seriously, my heart warm felt thank you for your time, for your for sharing your insightful views and um, the critical questions that you gave us to also continue to think about. Um, thank you, everyone. And with that, I would also like to extend my thanks to our wonderful comrades at Lighthouse and hand the mic over to Mary. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Thank you all so much for this fascinating conversation. Um, it is both terrifying and heartening um, to see so many people engaged, but also to learn so much from what you're experiencing, where you are, that is um, echoes so much, I think, of the kind of criminalization and the kind of censorship that people are attempting to put in place in the United Kingdom as well. Um, and that, that machinery is is happening. So I think it's great to have these conversations to learn from each other, to have the kind of international reach and learning um, that you have all offered us tonight and to those in the audience who tuned in from all over the world. Um, this, I hope, is the beginning of a conversation. There was clearly so much still to cover. So I hope that other institutions, other groups will host our incredible panelists to take these conversations forward. But also if you were watching tonight and we as Lighthouse could host a follow-up discussion in any way, then please do reach out so we can keep these things going. Do use your vouchers um, to read and support Palestinian writers um, through the website, uh, order them and redeem those. And I think uh, that leaves me only to give a final thank you um, to Panis and Raul for uh, putting this together, for bringing this event to us and giving us the privilege of hosting it. Um, so thank you all, everyone. And I am going to stop the live stream now and leave you 